I'm realizing that I glossed over some points in my previous video that may have been somewhat confusing, so this will be a quick video to explain those things. The first point that I wanted to explain is, what is specific excess power? Basically, it's the rate at which your aircraft's energy changes over time. We can get a better picture of what specific excess power means when we look at the energy flow diagram of an aircraft. All energy in the system starts off as chemical energy stored as fuel. This fuel is burnt, then turned into thrust by the engine and propeller. This thrust is what powers our plane and supplies it with energy. This thrust power can go into either gaining potential energy, altitude, or kinetic energy, speed. Once you have either kinetic or potential energy, they can be interchanged with each other based off of how your aircraft is maneuvering. You can turn kinetic energy into potential energy by using your speed to climb and decelerate, and you can turn your potential energy into kinetic energy by diving and accelerating. If this was the entire system, thrust would constantly be injecting energy into the aircraft, and so the aircraft would continue to gain energy until fuel runs out. However, there is energy loss in the system because of drag. Drag is basically air friction, affecting objects that move through the air, objects that have kinetic energy, so it drains from there. If we were to cut throttle, drag would continue to sap away at the energy of the plane until both potential and kinetic energy of our now glider are zero, meaning we would be grounded. Now that we have an idea of what aircraft energy flow looks like, we can write down an expression for aircraft energy, which is kinetic and potential energy added together. Because we know that the input and output forces into our aircraft are thrust and drag, we can equate our energy expression with the amount of energy in minus the amount of energy out. We've multiplied here by displacement because the amount of energy imparted by a force is that force times the displacement. We also want to scale our energy to our aircraft's weight because the amount of energy needed to achieve flight scales with weight, so specific energy or energy per amount of weight is actually more important than raw energy. It doesn't matter if we have a decent amount of energy f to power a biplane if the thing we're trying to actually get flying is a supermassive six-engine bomber. Now that we have the aircraft's specific energy, we are also interested in how this energy changes over time. To find the rate of energy change over time, or power, we have to take the time derivative. Doing so gives us the specific excess power. And so in layman's terms, specific excess power is basically just the rate at which your aircraft gains or loses energy in a particular situation. If we want to take a bit of a closer look at what affects specific excess power, thrust is dependent on velocity since, in props, the prop efficiency changes depending on the speed and in jets, the engine power increases with speed. Both of these things also change with altitude. Drag is affected by the square of velocity, which means at very high speeds, drag gets much larger than thrust. Drag is also affected by rho, the air density, which means it decreases at higher altitudes. And drag is also affected by a coefficient of drag, which for now we can think of as just how draggy the shape of our aircraft is. For example, lowering flaps increases coefficient of drag, and so does pulling angle of attack, which is why turning increases drag. All in all, we can see that specific axis power is affected by weight, speed, altitude, wing shape, and angle of attack. As much as it would be nice to be able to plot all of these factors that affect specific excess power and get a full idea of how it changes with every single one of these variables, our graphs are limited to two dimensions. So at least on our energy maneuverability diagram, we're plotting speed and turn against specific excess power. Now that we know what specific excess power is, how do we use it? Well, on our energy maneuverability diagram, let's take a look at the maximum instantaneous turn again. Because we're turning so hard and at such high speed, we'll be generating a lot of drag, meaning that our specific excess power will be very negative. So if we were to do a horizontal turn, we would lose kinetic energy at that rate, around 160 meters per second worth of energy. We could instead do a diving turn that would lose us potential energy instead of kinetic energy. And if we managed to dive at 160 meters per second, we would be able to maintain the turn without losing any speed. 160 meters per second, or 576 kph, is very fast, so instead you could do a shallower dive and lose an amount of both kinetic and potential energy, both of which would add up to 160 meters per second worth of energy. Another possible option would be to perform this turn vertically and upwards, meaning that you would gain potential energy but lose more than 160 meters per second worth of kinetic energy. All in all, the energy lost in total would have to be 160 meters per second worth of energy, no matter what orientation you perform this turn in. 
You can apply this logic to any position on this graph. The specific excess power on the EM diagram just shows you how much total energy certain maneuvers will cost you. It's up to you to decide whether you want to perform that turn and whether you want to pay that cost using kinetic or potential energy. It's up to you to decide what combination of potential or kinetic energy you want to pay with by deciding whether to maintain altitude and turn horizontally, sacrificing speed, to dive and sacrifice potential energy, or to climb and gain potential energy but lose even more kinetic energy. Specific excess power in the EM diagram also help to describe maneuvering energy retention. The way maneuvering energy retention is usually defined is that it's how well an aircraft maintains its energy in a turn. You can see now from the EM diagram though that saying a plane's maneuvering energy retention being good or bad is a rather gross oversimplification that can be good as a quick shorthand for telling people an aircraft's general flight characteristics. But you can see that this kind of simplification neglects the amount of variability that exists when discussing how well an aircraft holds its speed in a turn. Some planes lose more speed because they can pull more AOA and have tighter turns, but otherwise have the same flight characteristics. Does one have a better MER than the other? Or what about a plane that loses a lot of speed in turns but has a very high max sustain turn rate? Or a plane that loses speed slower but has a very low max sustain turn rate? These questions don't really have a good answer because maneuvering energy retention does not have a well-defined quantitative definition. Energy retention depends on the airframe, speed, turn rate, altitude, a whole host of other factors. And you can see here from the EM diagram that the rate at which energy is lost when performing a turn is non-linear and multi-dimensional, meaning that it's very reductive to boil it down to good or bad or better or worse. It's still helpful, of course, to say that a MiG-21 has a worse maneuvering energy retention than a MiG-19, since one is objectively better at maintaining energy than the other at all speeds, and it can be useful shorthand when you don't want to dive into the details of specific excess power. But the term is not quite as useful when trying to describe energy loss in situations that require more nuance. Also, to be clear, the numbers and bounds that I've listed for this graph in particular are specific to the P-51 D5 at sea level with no flaps on min fuel and no ordnance at WEP percent throttle. How I got these numbers? Well, I'll have to explain that in the next video. That's all I have to say for now. The next one might take a bit longer to make. I'm sort of sorting out the details on how I want to present the data, so bear with me.